All right, it is week nine. It is Tuesday. It's winter 2020. Let's talk, we're working on the prostate. We'll talk, do a little BHP. And we'll start prostate cancer today. So here we go. So the great paradox, we've actually been talking about the prostate a little. So what is the great paradox? Fact. Increased levels of prosthetic testosterone that's prostate that's testosterone that is found in the prostate is thought to be a major cause of prosthetic cell, prosthetic cell hyperplasia in aging men so in other words increasing levels of testosterone getting into the prostate is a major cause of BPH prosthetic hyperplasia okay so old men get prosthetic hyperplasia from testosterone Fact number two, increased age is directly related to decreased levels of testosterone. See the problem there? So increasing age increases, directly increases the risk of developing BHP. So these aren't matching, are they? You would think, well, if prostate hyperplasia is related to testosterone, but testosterone is decreasing in older men, it should go the other way, but it doesn't. So that's the huge paragraph. Uh, what's the proof that testosterone is the culprit here? If you castrate a boy, take away his testicles, and there goes his testosterone, they never get, never, and I don't say that very often, they never get BPH. So it's definitely dependent on testosterone. And they leave his prostate. The prostate is fine. So that's proof that it is testosterone. So the great paradox. So if older men have decreased serum levels of testosterone, why do they have such a high prevalence of BPH? That's the great paradox. It doesn't make sense. And for years, they couldn't figure this out. And we'll look at some of the older theories uh, on this. Um, but now we know. So here's a hint, the solution to the great paradox. Turns out that we've talked a lot about valves in veins in the lower extremities, but you also have a lot of valves in the testicular veins. Remember the testicular veins jump, dump into the caval circulation. Testosterone is made in the testes and it gets in to the, uh, the, the left testicular vein and right testicular vein and ends up being dumped into the vena cava. That's how you get testosterone. Guys get testosterone circulating through the body so it can bind to muscles and make you make you strong and make your beard grow and things like that. So, but we're dependent on these valves again. So does that give you a hint at, at what's going on here? So here's the solution. Uh, and this is the GAT theory. So in 2008, GAT published a kind of a landmark paper award-winning paper, uh, which solved, probably has solved the great paradox. No one's contradicted this yet, to my knowledge. Uh, and they discovered that by the age of 70, 75 percent of men had incompetent valves. So they, they did a study where they, um, they tested the valves, I think it was with ultrasound, but they tested the, the testicular valves and the testicular veins and they found that about 75% of them were shot. And then they went a step further. Um, they found a significant relationship between the ones who had valve mess-ups. That's called valvular insufficiency, testicular valve insufficiency, and the rate of BPH. So in other words, if you had shoddy valves in your testicular veins, you had a high chance of having BPH. Um, and so that was pretty cool. So testicular vein venous insufficiency equals benign prosthetic hyperplasia. But what's the mechanism? Well, it's got to be the shoddy valves, right? So come to find out the, uh, the detailed anatomy here uh, of guys. So Normally, of course, the lytic cells make testosterone, and it's carried through the panpiniform plexus and then up the testicular vein, and it gets into the vena cava. It goes into the left or right renal vein and then gets into the 
if you're vena cava and it's off to the body. But you also have some collateral side circulations here. In case you get a beaver dam here, you can you have to be able to get the testosterone out. There's several ways that you can get the testosterone out. Um, so this is what happens. So if the valves are shot, it's very hard to get the venous blood out because blood is ratcheted out. Mainly the m motion of the psoas and iliacus muscle um, helps pump the uh, the the v the venous blood out of the testicular veins. But if the valves are shot there's too much pressure uh, and the blood doesn't get out that way. Uh, some of it may, but it has to find another way. So some of it can go down this differential vein and dump in to this vein which dumps into the common iliac artery or dump, dump in this little uh, vesicular vein right here and that dumps into the internal iliac artery which goes into the common iliac artery. So that's another way to get it out, but some of the um, some of the testosterone and blood also flows through this uh, vesicular venous plexus, and it ends up bombing the prostate with testosterone. And it, normally, the testosterone in a healthy male, the testosterone shoots right up here, and there's no testosterone going out down any of these side roads. Um, so that's the theory. It, these little to in, to avoid the beaver dam, uh, the testosterone and blood is going through all these side roads, and some pure testosterone is being dumped right into the prostate. Right, and that is everything I just said. So you can read that. And yeah, so testosterone ends up in the prosthetic circulation, and uh, yeah. All right, and then once in the prostate, we already talked about last time about what happens to it. So the testosterone, once it, once it picks a cell like a smooth muscle cell or an epithelial cell of a gland or duct or a basal cell or maybe um, a fibroblast, it can pick a cell. Um, but once it gets inside the cell, remember testosterone is, is hydrophobic so it can go right through the cell membrane. Once it gets in a cell, it hooks up with type 2 5-alpha reductase and then it's converted into DHT. And so now you got way too much DHT inside the prostate and then that goes through that mechanism which we don't need to talk about again. So here's just another little, um, a little story, a little picture here of how that works. I don't know why I put that in twice, but there it is. So there are some older theories too that might help with this process. There's the estrogen theory. Uh, so as men get old, because men make estrogen as well, uh, but normally they make way more testosterone. So the estrogen to testosterone ratio is very small. But as guys get old and their testosterone drops, the estrogen to testosterone ratio greatly increases. And that is thought, that ratio is thought to stimulate the synthesis of too much type 2 5-alpha reductase in prosthetic tissue. Um, and that's not good. If you have too much of this enzyme, every single molecule of testosterone is going to be converted into DHT. Remember we said some testosterone can bind, get into the cell nucleus and, and get the central dogma going, but it's not very good at it. So if every single testosterone molecule is turned into a DHT, you're going to get way too much growth factor uh, produced via that mechanism. All right, so everything I just said there, and yeah, you get too many growth factors, and then you're going to get BPH from that. Uh, some other theories, so there's one about sympathetic tone that's been around for a while. Uh, so patients uh, who have high sympathetic tone from stress, chronic inf uh, have have BHP and at, at significant risk to have BHP. Patients with chronic inflammation throughout the body also have risk to have BHP. They're not exactly sure the mechanism here. They think maybe the an autoimmune attack of some kind causes cytokines and chemokines to be produced which stimulate the cells to proliferate. Uh, uh, insulin resistance is also somehow related to prosthetic perforation. 
a proliferation or the development of BHP. Uh, patients with metabolic syndrome are known to be insulin resistant, so these people all are all at risk. Uh, what about a genetic connection? Genetics is kind of uh, not the greatest connection here. About 50% of men under 60 who have had surgery for BPH, um, they are found to have a relative with a disease, so that does suggest some type of genetic link. And it's thought to be autosomal dominant, so it's very easy to get it. It's just one mutated gene will give it to you. Uh, first degree relatives uh, with uh, BPH pass along a fourfold risk of giving it to their male offspring. So that's the current thinking with genetics. Heavy smokers tend to turn on the sympathetics, which increase sympathetic tone, uh, increases the risk for BHP or BPH. Too much caffeine might do it. Chronic stress might do it through sympathetics. Here's a here's one. I always throw this one in here. People still miss it because they don't really watch this video. Some of you are, but a lot of you aren't. Uh, but this is a weird one. So you actually have a decreased risk of developing BPH uh, with alcohol consumption. So it's thought maybe it's kind of a depressant and it relieves stress and decreases sympathetics. They think that's the mechanism there. What are the clinical symptoms of BPH? 50, remember we said last time, 50% have no symptoms. So not all people with BPH are symptomatic. But the number one symptom is dysuria uh, with urination. Urination, by the way, is called micturition. Micturition is urination. To make sure you know that word, I assume you know that. That's, um, the th symptoms are thought to be secondary to uh, the bladder's response to the beaver dam. Remember, there's there's muscle, detrusor muscle is is automatically controlled, and it will contract again and again and again to try to push through the blockage, and you can wreck your bladder uh, by overworking the detrusor muscles. And yeah, if you ruin your bladder, you're going to end up wearing one of these things. So you have to be careful with uh, BPH. The specific symptoms of BPH include hesitancy, uh, that takes a long time to start urination, decreased force and caliber of the stream when it does come out, um, then after you go to the bathroom it feels like you have to go again. You get a sense that you're not emptying your bladder completely. And sometimes you don't empty your bladder completely and you double void. So if you have to urinate again within two hours, it's called double voiding. Straining to urinate to help the detrusor muscles. Sometimes even the detrusor muscles aren't powerful enough to push the urine through the blockage. So you have to crunch down, contract your abdominal muscles. Um, post, post void dribbling. Uh, is possible and I mean guys always dribble a little bit but this is a lot urgency they can't wait they have to run they feel like they have to go to the bathroom and then off they go frequent urination nocturia yep, so these are all symptoms of BPH Differential diagnosis, so other things can cause dysuria. Prostate cancer, which we'll start in a little bit. Urethral stenosis, a stricture. Bladder neck stricture. Uh, obstructive bladder stone, so kidney stone that gets in the bladder and clogs up the urethra. Or the ureter. Uh, urinary tract infection can get down into the, uh, into the ureters, the prosthetic urethra, I mean could get up in the ureters as well. Neurogenic bladder, maybe you have a herniated disc and it's smashing the S3 roots and it's knocking out your bladder function. So there's other things that can cause dysuria. I like that slide, by the way. What about the treatment for BPH? There's three strategies. So watchful waiting, medical therapy, surgical therapy. Let's take a look. Watchful waiting is really recommended for people with mild symptoms. 
So men with mild to moderate symptoms can be managed, but it's not recommended because you could wreck your bladder. Uh, so mild symptoms, you can just wait and see kind of what happens. So people with moderate symptoms, it's recommended that medications be tried to try to shrink the prostate. Uh, there's four types of medical therapy that are used for BPH. So, and they're all based on what the biopsy results show. So we have alpha blockers, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, combinations of these therapies, and then this phytotherapy, which I keep wanting to take that out, but um, you might have heard it's very not well supported by research, so I won't say much more about it. It's plants, using plants and herbs to, I think it's ridiculous. Popular, more popular in Europe. Um, hist histology and treatment. So when you have your biopsy, you need to find out what most, what is growing, what type of tissue. Because remember, there's different types of cells that can be affected with this. And so if you have a biopsy and, and it's your smooth muscles that have underwent hyperplasia. So you have way too many smooth muscles in the stroma. And this is the problem. Um, then alpha blockers seem to be the treatment of choice. They block the sympathetic nervous system's effect. Um, and so that's what you use for that. If the biopsy shows that you have hypertrophic epithelial cells and or basal cells, then 5-alpha reductase therapy is the key. Or if you have both, the biopsy shows smooth muscle and hyperplastic epithelium basal cells, you can use both. You can use a combination therapy. Um, for patients who have, they find hyperplasia is caused by too many fibroblasts, and you won't see fibroblasts, but you'll see the collagen that they make. Um, then, unfortunately, SOL, you are, uh, neither medication works. You're going to have to have surgery. So what type of surgery can you have? If medication fails, the next choice would be something called a TERP, and it's, uh, that's transurethral resection of the prostate. It's basically like Roto-Rooter. They basically Roto-Root out your, uh, your blockage. And here's actual, uh, let's go to this first, but it does not look fun, does it? Uh, they stick this kind of rectoscope down in through the penis all the way through the membranous urethra, penal urethra, membranous urethra, through the prostate, urethra, prostatic urethra, uh, and into the bladder, and they literally have a little wire, and they burn the tissue away, and they, they make a new hole. And there's a video you can watch if you want to see this. Uh, but here's the curve of the wire. This thing heats up red hot and just melts through tissue. All of this was completely blocked, almost completely blocked, and that's the only piece left, one little f piece flapping in the wind. So that's the prosthetic urethra completely cleaned by the procedure. Now there are complications. So when you go up here, there's an internal urethral sphincter, right? We have an external urethral sphincter right here. And then we have an internal urethral sphincter, which is automatic. And a lot of times it's damaged. In fact, 75%, and it's probably higher than this, 75% of the time, though, it's damaged uh, so normally when you ejaculate and you shoot sperm out and prosthetic juice and semen, normally it goes, goes to down the prosthetic urethra, out the penile urethra and into the vagina or wherever it goes. But, and the internal urethra contracts, has a reflex contraction. But if the, the internal urethra sphincter is damaged, it stays open. So when you ejaculate, some of the some of the semen and ejaculate, it goes up into the bladder and it's killed. So you lose part of your sp sperm um, and you lose the amount of material coming out during ejaculation. That's called a dry orgasm. And so that can lead to infertility. They can also damage the nerves in the procedure. 7% become impotent, can't get an erection. Uh, and incontinence is pretty rare, but under 1%. You could damage the internal and external your sphincter so bad that they don't work anymore. If that doesn't work, then you go to the prostatectomies. 
So there's a simple prostatectomy where it's kind of like a rotor root procedure as well, only they take a lot more out. Um, they basically take that transitional zone right out of there. They usually, well, there's different ways to do it, but they can come in through the bladder and work that way. And then there's a radical prostatectomy, sometimes called a total prostatectomy, and they go in surgically and just take the entire prostate out and kind of rebuild the prosthetic urethra uh, with synthetic tubes and such. There's some other kind of fringe ones. There's a microwave and a vaporization one. I'm not too interested in those, but you, need, you should know simple uh, and total prostatectomies. All right, should we start prostate cancer? It's been a long day. Well, let's just do a little bit of this. Uh, prostate cancer, this is a cancerous tumor. Uh, has developed somewhere in the prostate. We said usually in the peripheral region. 80% of the cases are diagnosed in men over 65 years of age. It doesn't mean a death sentence for sure uh, because it, it all depends what the biopsy says. Some of these cancers grow incredibly slowly. Some of them are incredibly aggressive. So it's definitely not a good thing to get if you're 50, 60 years old to get the diagnosis of prostate cancer. If you're 90 years old and get it, something else will probably kill you before the prostate does. But it all depends what the biopsy says. And because of uh, it's difficult to predict, it's a real challenge kind of figuring out what to do about this. Um, there are some signs of prostate cancer. PSA, prostate-specific antigen levels, will be raised. That's probably the classic way to catch it. Trouble is prostatitis and BPH also have can have raised PSA levels as well. There's a Gleason grading uh, method of where the, has, the pathologist will rate it uh, and see how cancerous the cells are. That's the gold standard with regard to prognosis. And I'm not going to, I took all those slides out. We're getting too far into the weeds on Gleason grading. The epidemiology, so this is the second most common and second most deadly cancer in men uh, based on the CDC. Lung cancer is number one. By the time these are caught, about 50% of them have metastasized. See, that's the problem with them um, is oftentimes they don't cause dysuria, so you have no idea that you have a problem. Uh, and the prostate exam, when they you know, they palpate the the peripheral part, of the, the posterior part of the prostate, uh, they might be able to catch it there, but a lot of times they don't. Guys hate to have prostate. I'm one of them. You know, who wants to have the prostate check? It's not the most fun thing in the world. Although I should say, I mean, I had a couple of them. It's not that bad. It's not just embarrassing more than anything else. Okay, here's some um, stats that is on the CDC website. And this research is from the American Cancer Society. So you can see in men the deadliest types of cancer, cancer that have killed the most men. This is 2020 data, so it's really fresh. Uh, 72,500 have died of lung cancer. And second place is prostate cancer for men, so it's still there. Colon cancer, rectal cancer is pretty close. Pancreatic cancer is surprisingly high. Females, same lung and bronchus cancer, tracheal bronchial tree cancer, you could say, uh, is number one. Number two is breast, uh, and then colorectal and pancreatic are uh, right there. More than 200,000 cases are diagnosed each year. Kills more than 30,000 men per year. Good news is the mortality has been on the decline since the mid-90s, probably improved treatment and better screening. It's down about 40%, so that's fantastic. Uh, the peak age, so one thing weird about prostate cancer, its peak age worsens with increasing age. So the older you are, the greater the chances are that you could get this condition. The lifetime risk for prostate cancer is 15%. What? 15%. The old saying, if guys could live to 110, they'd all have prostate cancer. Only 3%, however, actually will die of it. How about some risk factors? 
Well, increasing age, we already said. African Americans are at risk for these more than other populations. Um, if mom or dad had prostate cancer, then you have an increased risk. Uh, the risk increases inversely with the age of the family member affected. So the younger the age of the family member, the stronger the chances of you getting the disease. So a 40-year-old gets prostate cancer, his can have a much higher rate than if 90-year-old grandpa gets prostate cancer. It's not that much of a risk. Diets high in animal fat and red meat uh, increase the risk for prostate cancer. Diets high in fish decrease the risk. Although watch out for the mercury in fish these days. High intake of vitamin D and calcium um, is a risk factor. Vitamin E seems to decrease the risk. A previous vasectomy is not associated for a long time, they thought that having a vasectomy increased the risk of develop, getting prostate cancer. And it does not appear to be true. And we've known that since the 2000s. And there's these, here's an online calculator. You can calculate your own risk here, and they have these. Uh, where does it occur? I think we've already said the peripheral zone, about 65% of the time, that's where they develop. Uh, might catch it on prostate exam because that's what you can examine. That's the only thing you can really examine is that peripheral zone. 15% of the time in the transitional zone. That one's you really used, causes dysuria usually. You think it's BPH. 7% in the central zone. And remember the, the rectum. This is an overhead view. Here's the peripheral zone back here. There's a right and left lobe. Um, there's a capsule. I went to, God, I remember it taking me a week to get the story on this capsule. I just took it out because I don't think it's high yield. It's a really hard story to get. Um, but there's a capsule that tends to keep the prostate cancer in the inside the prostate, which is good. You definitely don't want peripheral cancer in the peripheral zone here. There are lymph vessels and blood vessels and veins right at these corners, so it's not good for it to get out in here. So if it does penetrate the capsule, it's a really poor prognosis because there's tons of highways where the cancer cells can fly all over the body. Invasion into the seminal vesicles also increases the chance of metastasis. So a terrible prognosis if it gets into the, if it invades the seminal vesicles. Uh, Precancerous conditions. So there are two, and I think I took all these slides out, but I just want to at least let you know there are two precancerous conditions. One's called PIN, prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia, and the other is an atypical small acinar proliferation, and we won't. I think the key point is just to know that I would probably remember PIN as a pre-cancer, a pre-prostate cancer. Some fun facts. Uh, in 95% of the cases, the cancer turns out to be an adenocarcinoma. And the cancer can invade the bladder sometimes, the bladder trigone specifically, and it can cause urethral obstruction, so you'll have dysuria not from the prostate, but because the bladder has become cancerous. And you remember there's the prostate butterfly there, and there's the bladder butterfly, and this is the trigone right here. De Novier's fascia, de non Villiers fascia. Um, so de non Villiers fascia is a very strong barrier and the cancer tends not to get into the rectum this way, um, so that's good. So prostate cancer usually doesn't spread into the rectum because of de Novier's fascia. It's a one-way barrier, though. People with rectal cancer, it can invade easily through de Novier's fascia, so it's very strange. Uh, de Novier's fascia is a one-way barrier. It doesn't let cancer out very easily, but cancer from the rectum can get in quite easily. There's de Novier's fascia, it's right here. And you're actually going to be palpating through that when we do the prostate exam next week. All right, see you later.